Miguel, thank you so much for joining the show um, between two weeks where we talk about motorcycles and filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about filmmaking, you are the man with the <laughs> four Emmys. <laughs> and uh, I kind of see you as as a kind of a mentor as well. I always when I need some suggestions or uh, some help for direction, you might go to Chris. So I'm very happy to have, have somebody very experienced here on the show and I'm very excited talk with you about some filmmaking, motorcycles, and hopefully a little bit insight and giving the people some tips and tricks on their way if they uh, are interested in filmmaking. Sure. So Miguel, um, can you give us a little bit background of, uh, of yourself? You, uh, where are you from and what led you to the creation and in, in the work of creation and filmmaking? Um, well, I'm, I'm Venezuelan, right? I was born and raised in uh, the outskirts of Caracas in a little uh, neighborhood called La Bollera. And, um, uh, well, you know, I, my original skill since I was a kid was to, like, draw and um, do, um, you know, illustrations, right? Um, so growing up, I thought that my, uh, my inclination was to try to find something that uh, a career, you know, where I could draw and I exercise my, my art, you know, I was always drawn into the arts. Um, but uh, being an illustrator in Venezuela or in South America for, for, the last, for general terms, um, it's, um, it's not really that lucrative. Um, and my, you know, my parents were like forcing me like, hey, you know, you, you should maybe like try a licenciature, like a real career to try to um, expand uh, your opportunities. So that's what I figured, like, well, maybe studying communications and, you know, landing in some sort of an agency, uh, I could do some art direction or start doing storyboards or whatnot, or maybe, you know, cell animation, you know, the traditional mm -hmm. cartoons, right? So that's how I ended up studying communication. And um, from there, I established uh, many relationships with uh, people who later on in life will be like, you know, presidents, networks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and um, through my illustration, again, you know, by, I used to do back then like little comics, uh, you know, underground comics in a, in a magazine called Clips in Caracas. And one of the guys that I um, met uh, in, in, in the, you know, in that world, he had a job in a post-production house. So mm -hmm. he got me the gig, you know, he, you know, one thing led to the other, uh, you know, and, and it ended up like working in the one and only uh, facility, post-production facility who, who did the visual effects in Caracas. Mm -hmm. So I was working in there and I learned like the, you know, pain box, we used to be like the <laughs> predecessor of, uh, of, uh, a very very basic photoshop you know but that was the, the machine at the time right? <laughs> you know and i learned everything about like you know working alongside editors and whatnot and what i learned in the school and put it all together and it started my career there um soon enough we made a piece that uh won an award in new york and uh, a company in new york called beetlejuice uh they noticed that and it was the heydays of television when there was a lot of money in the media. And they um, uh, they literally blind called me. You know, I was one day in the middle of nowhere in the hillbillies of the hillbillies, you know, <laughs> working. And then the phone rang and there was this guy speaking in English. And I was like, oh, if my English is bad now, imagine then. It was <laughs> like, hello, hello. You know? So anyway, so uh, uh, the guy is like, uh, uh, hey, listen, you know, we saw what you did. Uh, we really like uh, the job. and." Do you, you know, we would like to fly you for a weekend to New York and um, have an interview, a talk with you. Mm -hmm. And as I say, there were the heydays of television. There was a lot of money going on. So I was like, I was like 23 years old at the time. And I was like, oh, yeah, New York, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I came here, had an interview and sure, you know, I got hired on the spot. I think it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Um, from there on, I started my career here in New York, and uh, and that's you know as again you know it went from working in the machine, creating visual effects and animations and illustration for TV, 
to our direction then to create a direction and specialize in visual effects and exploding cars and killing people and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you also, but what I really find really interesting is you also work with, with A-list stars, right? So what I'm playing right now, what is his name again? William, William Fichtner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is like, how, first of all, how are you, are you getting on these kind of sets where you're working with the A-list uh, people? And the second question is, how is it to work with an A-list person? Well, you know, at the end, it's a human. It's a professional doing their job. In, you, know, you are in the set to do your part of the equation. You know, you're doing your job as well. So um, I guess you kind of have to, at the beginning, it's like, whoa, look at here. <laughs> you know, but like, uh, you know, um, uh, it's a little shocking at the beginning, you know, yeah. because it's very like uh, that wow factor. I mean, you saw these people before on TV or the big screen. Um, and now you have to be there to, you know, to direct them or to uh, collaborate in, to make the piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that kind of veil fade like really quickly, you know, you pass that and, you know, you get there and you do your job. Uh, it's fascinating. There's a lot of people, there's like any person, you know, there are people that are a little more... Uh, difficult or a little people that is a little easier to work with, uh, like everything in life. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's just um, it's something that with time, you know, really quickly. I I think personally that you know you kind of get over it and you just get there and do your job. Yeah. So for this scene, can you explain us a little bit what happened here and what did you do here? Oh yeah. Well, that was. Uh, that was a great piece. It was an opening for the Indianapolis 500. Yeah. And, uh, we wanted to do almost like a one big, like a feeling of a one big continuous walk uh, mm -hmm. of the actor delivering the, the script. Mm -hmm. And um, as he was talking about different fantastic moments on the history of the Indianapolis 500 race, you know, um, I wanted to recreate all those past events around him so mm -hmm. like for example that the car crash uh was recreated actually to the t like the 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 wheel spinning forward it happened actually during the 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 actual crash and yeah so everything was really like true to the history um and that, and that was actually so, a, a very well-researched project and fascinating to work with a 3d team and you know being on the set to prepare for those effects um mm -hmm. that's uh, that, that, that was pretty much what it was you know yeah is it when i'm i'm watching it's like almost like three minutes or almost four minutes long and it looks like almost like a one take it's maybe two in there how many tries uh did you need it to capture like all uh, like the, um, the actors saying like what he should say <laughs> The greatest thing of this shot is that he actually delivered the whole script at once. He memorized it. <laughs> he did the job. I mean, kudos. <laughs> I'm <laughs> proud of myself when I get yeah, the introduction he, of the show right and then I like three words, you know? <laughs> yeah, there is no stitches on this thing. He actually did the whole job. You know, what we were asking from him yeah. Uh, he delivered it, um, you know, but flawless. I mean, we probably did like maybe two max three passes on this um, just for his reactions, interacting with certain elements in the uh, in the shot who were actually real. Like, for example, the milk crates, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the first car that you see, the yellow car, is called the Wasp. And mm -hmm. that it actually, the Wasp was the very first car who won the Indianapolis 500 race that was in 1913, I believe. Um, and then, you know, that the WASP is actually stored in the museum, which is in, you know, in a location in the, at the track. Mm -hmm. uh, so we pulled, we, we took the permissions and everything to pull the car out. We actually pulled the car with a rope because it's not <laughs> running, right? Yeah. So we pull it with a rope and then post-production, we erase the rope and et cetera and make it look like he, you know, he was starting as he was walking by. Uh, the same when he passes next to the car of uh, 
Mario Andretti, uh, mm. famous uh, driver. Yeah. Um, you know, that was another car that we had in there. And so, so yeah, it's a mix of 3D. It, like everything in my job is uh, do um, um, uh, smoke and mirrors, right? <laughs> so you work with what you have. Yeah, we get um, one, one qu last question to, to this production. So this is about 10 years old, maybe not 10 years or less. But um, what do you see what changed in the environment from back in the days uh, doing stuff like that to today? How the, uh, did the industry, the filmmaking and the special, effe uh, special effect industry changed over the years? Well, uh, it, there is a... Uh, Technology has advanced to the point that allows to do more realistic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there is a component on this that um, the level of realism that we needed for the time frame that we had and also the budget that we had, um, mm -hmm. it had to be compromised in the sense, not compromised, but adapted to the fact that this is a sports event, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a, what we call a teaser, which is uh, it comes up before you know, the race, like literally, this is the first thing that comes on air. And then at the end, you know, it rolls, can't, you know, on live. And then it's like, welcome to the so-and-so edition of the Indianapolis 500, right? So the teaser has to, the, the, the objective of this piece is to kind of get people pumped up, right? Yeah. To, yeah. to tune in and then stay on. Um, and because the sports event is meant to be like bright in your face and really like gnarly, story in the narrative very gnarly used to capture you and just hold you there to watch the race so it's hence the colors the heavy vignettes all this stuff mm -hmm. right um and uh, that was kind of the thing to do about <laughs> 10 years ago you know yeah days we have more advanced uh things and in, in terms of you know uh, it also if the aesthetics kind of more with design and different, you know, like everything evolve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, design is not something in art, it's not a static. So mm -hmm. right now, all that kind of like is being changed into more muted colors and come more like a vintage feels. And, you know, the blacks used to be like, oh, you have to crunch the blacks. Now everybody's like, <laughs> don't crunch the blacks. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> you know, you adapt and you go with the flow in order to kind of keep yourself relevant in terms mm -hmm. of design. Um, and in terms of the art and creative direction. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, it all, it's all based on a good idea. If you have a good idea, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, that's what, how it goes. Yeah. You, you said just teaser, what I'm, I'm playing it right now. You're not only working uh, for, for the racing, you also do stuff for, for football, actually, right? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, I have the blessing to work with um, most of my clients are uh, sports. I work for ESPN, HBO Sports, uh, like uh, Showtime Sports. Um, I've done anything, you know, I've done graphics for the Super Bowl, uh, sitting on the truck, you know, from Tampa Bay while the New York Giants and the, um, the Baltimore Ravers, Ravens went like, you know, crashing helmets. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so for it, it's a uh, I've done like everything from baseball to football to lacrosse to mm -hmm. cricket in India. Um, I've done um, the openings for the Indianapolis 500 race. I've done NASCAR, uh, hockey, pretty much every sports out there. Besides, of course, my regular uh, um, agency clients who are more like product based stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I found uh, one trailer that you uh, did uh, from the commuter, mm -hmm. and I also put some behind the scenes. Let's watch it quickly, and then we're putting the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't there, right? Like uh, uh, he he plays for the Patriots, right? Rob, what is his name? Oh, I'm I'm bad in football. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this uh, is Gronkowski. Gronkowski, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he wasn't he wasn't there in the, in the film. So how how did you do it? Can you can you give us a little bit of background? How... Uh, yeah, yeah. This was a, a really really fun project. Um, mm -hmm. um, we have um, we were there was this is what is called a co promotion a copro right and the uh -huh. co promotion was between um, Lionsgate and um, 
uh, ESPN, and ESPN, you know, made a deal to kind of promote the the movie, the release of the movie at the time. Uh, and the way that they do it is in these co-promotions is they take, you know, they they spin the sports world into the movie somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea from the creative side of ESPN was uh, to involve Groundkowski. Uh, because he has a really funny personality to, you know, to sit in on the train and make it interact with the movie. Of course, the movie was already shot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was, uh, I was tasked into doing this, you know, into inserting, pardon me, I'm inserting Gronkowski into the train. Uh, yeah. Make him react to the conversation. So it was really funny because, uh, we had to like define what part of the conversation in the movie was logical and will make sense to have the whole thing kind of flow. And then of course, where he's sitting, um, there was no, uh, you know, th there was really not a, a backplate for him. So I have to kind of, uh, as you can see in that frame that you have up, I have to take uh, part of the footage where, um, Ian Limsel, if I can pronounce it well, you know, sorry. Uh, he, mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the set and I have to erase him. I have to kind of create uh, a mask for where the train was. So I have to create a fake uh, background of the train. Yeah. Then uh, sit ground casket on this chair, which is completely painted, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> literally painted. Um, and then uh, if you see a part of the set, I had to kind of mask her and have him sit on the back. When we were on the set, of course, I, ha I will have all these plates in an A, B box where I can just kind of half dissolve life on the set and kind of fix his position to match, um, you know, what I wanted. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I had to do on the set is a double green screen, as you can see right there, because I needed to have him shot with two cameras. The mm -hmm. client didn't understand this one for until at the very, very, very end. They were like, why don't we have to pay for two cameras? It was like, trust me on this one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the whole thing was like, of course, I'm shooting him, uh, you know, in the, the position that he's sitting on the train, but he's sitting right next to the window. So his reflection is not literally copying him and pasting him. It's just literally the, the opposite, right? Oh, Angle. yeah, yeah. You know? So if he has the newspaper, you know, what you see from the newspaper is the back of it, but in the reflection, you see what he's reading. <laughs> okay. So I have another camera set on a different set of green screen yeah. in order to have that effect. You know, what's happening in the back is also, uh, you know, CG generated. And then yeah. the other hard part of this is uh, uh, in the finishing part of the compositing, it was to have every time that a light passes through, you mm. know, play with the mask and the color correction to have him lit. You know what I mean? Yes, None of that yes. was, all, was the, all that was done with um, um, CG lights, not obviously yeah. not something that happened on the set. Um, all this, it, it was really funny because even the stuff that was on the paper, there was no art direction. They didn't have the, the budget to fully have a, a, an art department. So I was there with a Sharpie. <laughs> 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 So you have to improvise. So it's like, and this is kind of something that uh, makes a dent and make an impression on your clients. Uh, you know, when you go a little beyond and above, you know, like what you are supposed to do, but you are there to get it done. You know, so that's yeah. that's kind of like what the intention of that was. Yeah, that was definitely a fun project to work on. Nice. And he was really really funny in general. There was a lot yeah. of takes that we didn't use at the end, mm. but he was really really hilarious. Yeah, nice, Miguel. Let's go to motorcycling. You're not only creative um, film by, by filmmaking. If you're not filming or being creative on your computer, then you're traveling around the world. That's on, right. On two wheels. Uh, and uh, you have a, a motorcycle. How do you call it? It's not a motorcycle company. It's not a club. Um, can you explain us a bit more what uh, Motor Wolf is, where you're the founder of? Yeah, well, Motor Wolf, it was just, uh, it, you know, it, it really started as a, you know, as a, an Instagram like ID, you know, <laughs> but that evolved into eventually evolved into a brand. Uh, we were manufacturing um, motorcycle vests, and from that actually spawned into something 
even bigger, which we created a, a network of motorcyclists uh, that was called the Motor Wolf Long Distance Riding Club. Mm -hmm. and, um, basically, you know, we had, it was uh, near 40 um, members around the globe. Um, and basically they were like just networking. We have a forum and we'll get there and just talk about, um, you know, hey, listen, you know, I'm crossing here, you know, this border, or you guys think, or, you know, we will discuss, uh, you know, motorcycle packing, or we will discuss, like, and we also had something that was really fun. It was called the Rye Far Games. And mm -hmm. basically it was, uh, it was a club uh, kind of game that, it was based on a number of, uh, you, you, there was two tiers. One, it was local, you know, so for, it was people competing within the United States and Canada. And then the other mm -hmm. was like international. And it was like every flag, every country that you ride, it has like a hundred points. Um, uh, like major road around the world. Let's say that you did the, um, you know, Route 66, or maybe they did the Stelvio Pass in, in, in Italy, then we'll have certain points. And then also your live kilometers will give you more points. And so there was a ranking. Everybody was kind of like trying to get every summer or whatever it was <laughs> to get into this kind of fun uh, competition that we had. Um, it was very healthy, nothing like, you know, oh my God, you know. <laughs> We have prizes for like people that was like, hey, you know, if you get to a certain amount, you know, we'll give you a vest or, you know, whatever it was. We, but, but in reality, it was just like a fun way for us to kind of like be all tied up. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, you said, traveling and you traveled how many countries did you say? Uh, I've traveled in motorcycle 36 countries so far. <laughs> 30, 36. So what yeah. is your most memorable um experience that you have uh, while traveling almost around the whole world? Well, this, uh, well, you know, experience many, right? Really, because uh, each each country has its own um, charm, right? And, and mm -hmm. but for me, it's just about discovering the both the beauties and tragedies of, you know, countries and cultures around, uh, around the world. But um, definitely one of the most uh, fantastic experiences that I had was to travel from this I would say two you know one was to travel from Queens New York to the Arctic Circle on the wrong bike on the diner the Hardy, right <laughs> no windshield you know yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was that and then the other was to um, you know tra traveling around um, Ru Russia that was also quite a quite an experience that was completely open up my eyes to a culture that I was it was very foreign to me in in any sense like food colors language you know mm -hmm. music yeah it was very foreign and, and just let myself go there uh was uh was really really interesting really like eye-opening you know like uh that Russia was fantastic Do you take the the Harley as well to Russia Pardon me? Did you use the Harley as well for, for Russia? I No, I actually found uh, in uh, Moscow, I found a fat boy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and it was also the wrong bike for it. <laughs> the wrong bike. Yeah, your new yeah. bike. The funny thing there we was, go. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I have an Africa twin because I kind of came down to my senses and it was like, okay, if we're going to keep doing this, let's do it with the wrong <laughs> <laughs> Are you but like the in Russia, I tell you, like, it was crazy. Uh, I actually had to, I, I ended up crossing uh, one of the largest storms that ever, that, that have hit Moscow in the last 90 years. And it was mm -hmm. that day that I was just like, okay, let me take this fat boy out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the truth is yeah. like that. Definitely that and, and, the, and the going from New York to the Arctic Circle was definitely um, something that, that just, you know, those are like the experience that I, I, I really, 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 um, as somebody's asking if I learned Russian, I learned some basic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks uh, Triumph Brooklyn for turning in. Did you, did you learn Russian? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, shoot like a tatsa na motorcycle. 
посему, потому что вам Бог. Share a little bit your experience. You, I'm pretty sure you were nervous and excited. Can can you run us through a little bit what happens behind the scene and how you felt about everything? Uh, well, it is it is always exciting from the moment that somebody, you know, your client call or you know calls and say like, "Hey, we're nominated." You know, from that moment you're <laughs> like, "Oh my god!" Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> So, in uh, uh, the funny part about nominations is that throughout my careers, I have 30 years doing this, and throughout my careers now, I have 16 nominations to the <laughs> 16, <laughs> wow. 16 nominations, yeah. Um, and then every time that it happened, it's like, from the very first one, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> 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 All right. It never gets old. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's just because um, the reason that I say that it never gets old is just is, uh, the fascination comes from the fact that the people that goes into that room and the people who uh, constitute the um, the jury, right, of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. event is, uh, is a very prestigious uh, award, right? Uh, it's the pinnacle of television. It's like the Oscars for the movies, right? Yeah. So... Um, the people who goes there and makes these decisions are like your peers. And then being recognized by such high level of people, people that, you know, I have a lot of respect for, you know, um, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it really is, it's an extraordinary, um, very humbling uh, experience, you know. Um, yeah. the, the, what happened, I can tell you, you know, like once you get the call, yeah, sure, the nomination is great. But then it comes the day of the event, and then um, <laughs> it's the one one time a year that I have to put a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a stupid question, but are they paying uh, for you to fly you out in the hotel, or how, how does it work? Well, they decline arrange everything, and um, sometimes I mean, like, there's uh, the sports Emmys uh, are actually held in New York, so sometimes when that happens, I just you know I just have to go to my head. So. Yeah. But then, you know, it's this, it's again, it's, you know, there's like the, um, you know, the red carpet and all this flashy stuff. And there's like big athletes and names and uh, uh, television uh, personalities um, there. And um, that makes it very, very uh, flashy. You know, you have to kind of really keep yourself composed in that sense. Because also it's just like your client is there. So you don't want to mess up. <laughs> you know? Um, you need to behave a little bit too. Yeah, and then when it comes down to your category, because you're sitting there clapping <laughs> everybody, right? <laughs> when it comes down to you, that's when you start sweating. You know? yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, now it's been okay. You know, I'm like, yeah, if I don't win, that's all right. You know, I think I proved myself. You know, for them, yeah. that's fine. But uh, uh, you know, that's when you start sweating. And you're like, oh my god, and then you start like you know, thinking like, did I bring my, you start touching yourself like, oh, did I bring my speech? Did I just, like, oh, yes, <laughs> <there."> <laughs> anyway, you know, it's silly uh, stuff, but, uh, but, you know, at the end, it's uh, just being in, uh, up there in the podium and, um, you know, receiving such a word, again, it's just a humbling, uh, uh, I'm very grateful that this happened because, again, I, I respect very much the, you know, the panel and, and the people who, who is there uh, because they're, you know, people that I admire. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, camera equipment. So when you shoot personality or shooting for, for a client, what do you prefer? What kind of camera gear do you usually use or is your go-to? Yeah, well, <clears throat> usually back in the day, I... Uh, I used to do red for heavy special effects stuff. 
uh, with red cameras, but I, I, it became, but, you know, like the, the compatibility, you know, with, of red cameras with, um, um, with the, the, the software and the platforms that I used to work with, which is like Autodesk, uh, Maya, and Flame. Mm -hmm. it, 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 the, the workflow was a little convoluted. You know, you have to have a third party software in order to convert the red file to be read by Autodesk. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. and then to, you know, to send it to an editor and the editors down converting and referring to that footage. You know, you know it was kind of like too, too you know, too uh, difficult, right? too entangled. Um, so I decided to, you know, I jump into the wagon of uh, Ari. Yeah. <laughs> the, biggest, yeah. the biggest wagon, the most expensive. Yeah, it was thing. like, hey, you know what? You know, this worked great. Yes, these cameras <laughs> they do everything that I need. You know, so uh, um, most of the stuff that you see in a, sh uh, a shot with, um, mm. uh, with Ari cameras, like either Alexas or Minis, uh, Amiras, you know, that's yeah. kind of like where I go to. It just, the workflow is great. It just go, boom, it just gets into the flame. Your, your yeah. log seat right there, you can just go for it. Yeah, so for the people who doesn't know, Ari cameras are like $100,000 just for one one camera. It's like the top of the top where all the blockbusters are filmed with. So this is your go-to camera. Good to know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it works with Ari, you know. You know. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> it's not my money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you, um, if somebody is uh, getting into filmmaking and um, trying to build up his portfolio and stuff, do you have any tips and tricks that you can share with the people where they should focus on, where they should set their priorities? Well, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, it, and this happens, you know, I had the, the blessing of uh, doing um, uh, a lecture at the Bauhaus uh, School of Design in Germany, in, mm -hmm. um, in, um, in Dissol, and, um, which is the makeup of design, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, since then, I've been repeating this almost like a mantra. I think the, you know, the best advice that I can give anybody is just focus on the people, mm -hmm. not, on the not on the technical aspect of it. You know, and what I mean by this is like relationships that you make are stronger or going to take you farther than, you know, the technology. Because the technology is going to have a, you know, a lifespan, right? So you can learn, you know, um, I think I'm frozen. Oh, what kind of... Uh, So Miguel, Miguel, I don't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Yeah, Miguel, I think we can't hear you anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot hear you. And I, I see Lou, Louis in the chat as well. He just said he can't hear, hear him either. Yeah. You want to drop off and come in? You want to? Yeah, audio issues. I see that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. So um, Miguel just left the chat and uh, he's uh, coming back and then, uh, and then uh, hopefully we can hear him again. It's, uh, there, there we go. He's going to reconnect. It's getting into the chat one more time. And it's connecting, waiting, connecting. Let's see. Miguel? Uh-huh. <laughs> now, now we can hear you again. <laughs> and that was my best tip. That was, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when we stopped, or when we stopped hearing you. So yeah, for new people who are getting into filmmaking, 
uh, I hear that and I know for myself it's like getting clients and uh, trying to build this relationship, getting paid gigs and so on. If, for you it's easy to say, I'm sorry to say that with 30 years in the game you have your relationships and uh, your clients that you usually work with. But do you have any recommendation how people can build up their relationship, how they're getting quicker into paid uh, gigs when they're starting? Well, you know, it's, it's, again, you know, everything happening, you know, it's, it's something that goes with flow, you know, it's, you gotta trust and you gotta show yourself. And then, you know, you gotta like, try to do the best you can at every gig that you get in order to kind of create good impressions, kind of multiply their impressions. So um, it, it, this has been a, you know, as I said before, it's been 30 years doing creative directors and, you know, being on the, on the business. Um, so it's, it's a lengthy process, you know, you can start with one person and, you know, make that person trust and you know, everything in life. Right? At the end, it's, you know, the human connection and, and, and that trust is something that definitely is more valuable than any technology. And of course, you have to go there and, 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 and know the craft. But again, you know, the craft is, is only limited. And at the same time, the craft can be done by many people, you know. Just pushing the same enter, you know, control F7, enter, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the thing, right? So it's really the craft is one thing. And the other thing is, you know, work on your own vision, your own style. So you have something, something unique to offer. But at the same time, just concentrate and, you know, making sure that that client have that extra mile of love, you know, and making sure that people, you know, you go, you call them and say like, hey, you know, like, like I, all times I call them like, guys, uh, you know, are you guys right now okay? I'm not asking for work. I'm just like, guys, are you guys okay? Are you guys self and healthy right now? You know, like, mm -hmm. you, you guys need masks? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that kind of, like, that kind of relationship is what you want to build, you know? Yeah, that's that's nice. Say okay, Miguel. I think it's time to to wrap up. Um, can you give uh, the people uh, the information where they can uh, where they can find more information about you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I love that. Um, so, first thing is well, Motor Wolf through Instagram is just uh, my silly trips. You know, um, it's, it's pretty much motorcycle stuff. Uh, but also in there, you will see on my, um, um, uh, you know, on the introduction, you're gonna see the my other Instagram, which is Miguel Oldenburg, and it's about my art and my um, uh, my work. I just recently started that, so I don't have much. But uh, it is uh, MiguelOldenburg.com, uh, where you can see a wide spectrum of my design, my arts, my paintings, and also my work, uh, my media work, uh, my creative direction. And I also have a blog where I explain from time to time how I do, the way I do things. Um, just for fun. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, this is, I just put up a, a few videos here, but if you go on Miguel's website, he has in-depth reviews and written form and also pictures how he how he's doing his jobs and these are like big clients that you see there are very famous people as well and very uh, deep insight um, how, how he works on, on the, these kind of projects so it's I highly recommend to visit the guys website check that out if you're interested in filmmaking um, it's, it's, it's cool yeah <laughs> Miguel JP thank yeah. you so much for having me here um, I really appreciate your, your kindness man. Uh, no worries. I'm happy that you joined, and I'm Miguel. Like always, I'm I'm happy looking forward up for our new projects. Right on. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Miguel. Take care. Take Thank care, you. guys. Thank you, everybody who joined.